So the first person to present today is Mary Abed Al Ahad from the University of St Andrews, and she is a PhD in she's a PhD student in geography at the University of St Andrews, and she's affiliated with the PhD program at the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research in Rostock, Germany. So her work examines the effect of air pollution and weather changes on health, mental health, well-being. Uh, mortality and hospital admission in the general population and by ethnic subgroups. So today she's going to present some of that work and I'm going to hand over straight to Mary so that she can start her presentation. Over to you. Thank you so much, Darmi, for, for the introduction. So I just share my screen now. Let's hope it works. So good afternoon, everyone. So I am Mary, a second year PhD student at the School of Geography in the University of St. Andrews. And today my presentation is entitled Individuals Exposure to Ambient Air Pollution and Self-Reported Men Mental Wellbeing in the General Population and by Ethnic Subgroups in the UK, uh, which is a longitudinal analysis based on the UK household longitudinal survey data. So first, I will give a general introduction about the topic. So mental health problems are noticeably rising globally, and this is causing serious socioeconomic losses to the societies. And according to Vigo et al. in 2016, the global burden of mental diseases was estimated at 32% of years lived with disability and 13% of disability adjusted life years. So mental um, health problems are a serious issue. Um, mental health disorders are mainly triggered by genetics and or by psychosocial risk factors. However, recent literature has been showing a relationship also between environmental factors, including exposure to ambient air pollution and mental well-being. However, most of this evidence is still fragmented and inconclusive. So how does now air pollution affect mental well-being? So it can affect it either directly or indirectly. So it can affect it directly through biological mechanisms. So particulate matter of small diameters, um, such uh, of small diameters such as PM1 or PM2.5, might initiate oxidative stress and lead to the formation of inflammatory cytokines that infiltrate the blood-brain barrier, causing neurodegeneration and neuroinflammation. Also, um, particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide pollutants have been linked by observational research to increased rates of several depressive disorders and mental uh, well-being disorders such as autism spectrum, uh, schizophrenia, dementia, psychotic experiences, cognitive disabilities, and anxiety. Also, air pollution can affect mental well-being indirectly, and this could be through the nuisance and individual coping behavior to deal with this air pollution and nuisance caused by it. So some of the air pollutants can cause aesthetic or odorous nuisance, and this will inhibit uh, psychological supporting outdoor activities. Uh, due to air pollution, and this in turn can lead to cognitive anxiety, stress, loneliness, which lead to general fatigue and perceived symptoms of poor mental well-being. And in a recent uh, systematic literature review of 178 published articles, it was shown that air pollution um, is to degrees happiness and life satisfaction substantially and also to increase anxiety, annoyance, and mental problems, and even suicide ideation. And also it leads to coping approaches such as avoidance behavior and migration to an area with less um, air pollutants. Also, air pollution can lead to experiential anxiety emerging from worrying feelings about one's physical health and future. So because there is more conclusive research about the effects of air pollution on physical health, including cardiopulmonary, um, immune system, and cancer diseases, people who live in highly polluted areas might also experience stress and worrisome feelings of getting physical illness because of this air pollution, and this also will impact their mental well-being. So despite the establishment of linkages between air pollution and mental well-being in the literature, the results are still inconclusive. Most of the studies were cross-sectional or longitudinal studies that lack spatial temporal specificity and lengthy follow-up times. 
And to date, no study has tried to address the association between long-term air pollution exposure and mental well-being use, using a within between longitudinal design, which I will explain in a bit in the methods section. And published research also have not yet covered all population types and the potential moderating effect that key um, demographic groups might have on this association between air pollution and mental well-being. For example, only age and gender social demographics are considered by most of the literature. However, ethnicity is not being considered in this topic. Therefore, examining how the effect of air pollution on mental well-being varies by ethnic groups, such as um, this can provide us with more conclusive um, results. So our, um, this study, it aims to assess longitudinally the overall and the between within effects of long-term, uh, which is 11 years exposure to four air pollutants, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter of 10 and 2.5 diameters. Um, in the UK on individuals reported mental well-being, which was measured using the 12 items um, general health questionnaire scale. And also we aim to assess whether ethnic minorities um, such as Pakistani and Bangladeshi Indians, Black African Caribbean and other ethnicities and also non-UK born individuals if they suffer from a more pronounced risk for mental well-being with increasing concentrations of the four pollutants. So methods, we use data from the UK Household Longitudinal Understanding the Society data, and we had a sample of 60,146 uh, adult uh, individuals uh, who provided 349,748 repeated responses across 10, 10 waves of data collection, which is equivalent to 11 years from 2009 to 2019. And this individual level data was linked to yearly concentration of the four pollutants using the local authority of residence for each individual. Later, we took the air pollution concentration and we decomposed it into between and within effects. So the between effect is the average 11 years of air pollution for each local authority. Whereas the within effect, it is the annual air pollution deviation from the 11 years average for each local authority. And then we examine the association between air pollution and self-reported mental well-being in the general population and also by ethnic groups using uh, three levels, multi-level mixed effect linear models, adjusting for important social demographics, cigarette smoking and year dumbness. Just to note that um, mental well-being was assessed using the general health questionnaire, which has 12 items that assess, um, that capture non-psychotic psychiatric illness. And these um, 12 questions relate to mental well-being of um, the interviewed individuals in the past few weeks preceding the data collection. And responses for each of these 12 questions are assessed on a four-point Likert scale, and then they are um, dichotomized, and then they are summed up, which results in a general score for the mental well-being that ranges from zero to 12, with higher scores indicating poorer mental well-being. Now we come to results. So this table shows descriptive statistics for the first wave of um, the understanding society data and for the last wave. So we can see that the majority of the sample are females. They belong to the middle age group from 34 to 58 years old. And the majority are British white and the other ethnicities they, they are approximately 4%. So for example, Pakistani and Bangladeshi, they are 3.5% in wave one and 4.5% in wave 10 of this data. Uh, those, the majority were not, uh, were born in the UK, 86%, and um, around 14% were not born in UK. 53% um, were married, um, around, uh, one third of the sample had university degree and one third had high school uh, degree. And fifth, around like 60% of individuals said that they are living comfortably slash doing all right with respect to their financial situation. Majority also were non-smokers and only around 20% were smokers. This graph here also shows the um, air pollution levels um, across years from 2009 to 2019. 
And we can see fluctuations, some fluctuations in the air pollutants. However, we can notice that in general, air pollution decreased in recent years. So if we compare, for example, um, 2009 with 2019, we can see for all the pollutants, the level now is less than it used before. So now we come to the multi-level um, regression model results. And here we are showing the overall pollution effect as well as the between effect, which shows us the spatial effect of air pollution, like the effect of uh, living in more uh, polluted local authorities versus not, and the within pollution effect, which is more temporally. So it shows how the variation in air pollution across time affects the well-being within each local authority. So we can see that the overall pollution uh, has a positive effect on mental well-being, which means as the concentration of all of these four pollutants increases, the mental well-being will become poorer. And we see a similar picture for the between spatial effect of air pollution. Uh, however, for the within effect, which is more temporary, we didn't see any significant association. Now, this graph here, it shows how this association vary between ethnic groups. Generally, we, we don't see um, any conclusive evidence that, uh, that the association between air pollution and mental well-being varies by ethnic groups. So it's just related to um, Pakistani slash Bangladeshi. They are showing poorer um, mental well-being with increasing concentrations of particulate matter 2.5 and sulfur dioxide and only also for non-UK born individuals. However, it's not very conclusive. And also when we assess the between and within effects of air pollution, also we don't see any conclusive um, evidence. So concluding remarks, using longitudinal individual level and contextual linked data, this study highlighted the negative effect of air pollution on individuals' mental well-being over time. So as the concentrations of air pollution increases, mental well-being will become poorer and significant overall and between effects uh, like spatial, between effects are spatial, between local authorities were shown for all the four pollutants. So this shows that if you live in a more polluted local authority, you will experience poorer mental well-being. However, like fluctuation of air pollution across time doesn't affect your mental well-being so much. And analysis by ethnicity didn't show um, conclusive evidence. It just showed elevated scores of poor mental well-being with increasing concentrations just of sulfur dioxide and particulate matter only for one ethnic group, which is Pakistani and Bangladeshi and non-UK born individuals, but not for the other ethnic groups. So environmental policies to reduce air pollution emissions can eventually improve the mental well-being of people in the UK. However, we didn't find any conclusive evidence on the moderating effect of ethnicity. For future research, we recommend data that can be used to link air pollution to individual level data at a finer spatial resolution level, because here we use the local authority. This is what was available for us with this data set. However, um, for future, we will be using another data set, which is the Scottish Longitudinal Study, which allows linkages at um, the postcode level of air pollution rather than using the local authority. So we, we are hoping to see um, more uh, interesting results there. So thank you so much for listening for my presentation today. And this is my email address in case anybody um, have any questions later. And I'm looking forward for the discussion and questions. Okay, we're gonna um, go to our next presentation now. So our next presenter today is Sophie Baker from Bangor University. So Sophie's in the final year of her PhD. She's funded by the ESRC and she is based at Bangor University. So she's interested in the social determinants of psychosis in minority groups with a particular focus on linguistic minorities. And her PhD is looking at the mental health of linguistic minorities in Wales using both qualitative and quantitative methods. So over to you, Sophie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sophie and I'm an ESRC funded PhD student at Bangor University, 
working under the supervision of Dr. Chris Saville and Dr. Mike Jackson. So today I'm just going to take you through uh, some preliminary findings of one of my PhD studies, which uses National Survey for Wales data to examine group density associations for mental health in language, national identity and ethnic groups in Wales. Uh, so I'll just begin with a bit of background. So mental illness is not equally distributed throughout the population. Rather, our risk of developing a mental illness varies substantially by social group and geographic area. So this is not a novel finding. Uh, seminal work by Farris and Dunham and Odegaard as far back as the 1930s found higher rates of psychiatric admissions in migrants to the United States. Um, two conflicting explanations stem from these findings. Farris and Dunham proposed a social causation hypothesis, suggesting that living in socially adverse neighbourhoods is what drives the increased risk, while Odegaard thought the higher rates in migrants were due to selective migration. In other words, individuals who are more vulnerable to developing a mental illness are more likely to migrate or drift into these more deprived areas before the onset of the illness. So um, since these early studies, there have been significant statistical advancements, which makes it easier to kind of disentangle the individual and area level variables associated with mental illness. Uh, one well replicated epidemiological finding is that some ethnic minority and migrant groups have poorer mental health than their um, majority group counterparts. However, the extent of this risk is somewhat contingent on the immediate area in which the minority group individual lives. For example, uh, ethnic or group density associations have found that minority group individuals have better mental health when they live in areas where their group is well represented compared to minorities living in areas with a low proportion of their own group. There is some suggestion that low own group density areas do not pose the same risk across different minority groups and risk is particularly marked in black individuals. And to date, um, most group density studies have examined uh, these kinds of associations in ethnic minority and migrant groups. Um, so there are, uh, in terms of mechanisms, there are material and psychological reasons that might help to explain the poor mental health observed in some ethnic minority and migrant groups. Um, material processes refer um, to factors restricting an individual's access to resources, networks, and a voice to uh, kind of gain control over their life and personal circumstances. For example, um, discriminatory behavior or policy directed to towards ethnic minorities that restricts their access to opportunities and resources and sustains an equal uh, power balance between the minority and majority group. Psychological processes refer more to the mental consequences of belonging to a group that one perceives as lower status. Um, it is thought that ethnic minority in itself is not a risk factor for mental health, rather belonging to a disempowered or marginalized group. Um, the evidence base is limited, but some studies have found that these density relationships extend to other types of minorities, such as those classified by political affiliation, lower social class and sexual minority status. Um, to identify mechanisms involved in the group density effect, it is therefore theoretically interesting to examine group differences in the effect, including in minorities um, classified by other types of social characteristics. Um, and language is quite interesting in this regard because languages differ in terms of power and status, and it's quite a salient marker of um, in-group identity. Uh, language can, of course, also present other more practical challenges for individuals who are not able to communicate in a widely spoken language in their local area, which might pose problems with accessing social capital, for example. Uh, national identity is uh, of interest because I guess it's kind of a classic us versus them variable. Um, it's also quite interesting in the sense that it's more of a flexible identity compared to ethnic group and language status. Um, so in short, examining associations in these different types of groups can help provide clues as to the important social processes involved in the risk of um, lower own group density areas. Um, Wales is a good social context within which to uh, examine these group density effects. So 
Welsh speaking ability is very socially salient in Wales. Um, Welsh is an official language of, of Wales, but is only spoken by about 19% of the population. However, if we consider this at smaller neighbourhood level, uh, Welsh speakers actually comprise the majority in many areas. So um, most Welsh speakers are bilingual uh, Welsh and English speakers. So English speakers who do not speak Welsh are more likely to be linguistically isolated in their area in the sense of them not being able to communicate in a widely spoken language where they live. Uh, these maps show units of geography at the lower super output level or the LSOA level, which are units of geography comprising about 1500 people. Uh, the map on the left shows more uh, Welsh speaking areas in the darker blue colours. So as you can see, um, most of the uh, most Welsh speaking areas are situated in the west of the country, uh, but there is high variation in Welsh speaking when we look at this small neighbourhood level. The second map indicates more Welsh identifying areas. So the proportions of people who selected that they have a Welsh national identity in the, in the census. So as you can see, um, there's a lot of highly Welsh identifying areas, and this is particularly high in the south of the country, in Cardiff and in the South Wales Valleys. Uh, the third map shows the geographical distribution of non-white British ethnic minorities. And the fourth map indicates area deprivation as measured by the Welsh index of deprivation. So the darker colours on the map indicate um, higher levels of deprivation. So um, many group density studies are conducted in kind of large urban cities, often in England and the Netherlands. Uh, so Wales is quite a different study setting, it's more rural. And for example, if we were to look at these kinds of density effects in London, for example, um, ethnic minority position and linguistic minority um, status perhaps more conflated. Um, so uh, given that it seems plausible that mechanisms involved in the ethnic density effect might extend to other types of identities, we expect to see group density associations for all three identity types. We expect to see a group density relationship for ethnic minorities uh, in line with many previous studies. But we also expect these effects to extend to language and national identity. Uh, for our data set, we obtained a license from the Welsh Government to uh, obtain the LSOAs for individual respondents. This was merged with area level data from the 2011 UK census. Um, we combined the data from the 2012 to 13, 13 to 14 and 14 to 15 waves of the survey. Uh, so we had a sample size of 28,248 people. Um, we derived a continuous mental health dependent variable from a factor analysis of four mental health related outcomes in the surveys. Uh, so as an example, uh, for the anxiety variable, respondents were asked to rate how anxious they felt yesterday on a 10 point scale. Um, for our analysis, we used the GLMM TMB package in R. We fitted mixed effects models to test the presence of each of the three, uh, sorry, test the presence of group density associations for each of the three um, identity types. So the first model comprised of the interaction between the individual and the area level variable as fixed effects. For example, the interaction between Welsh speaking status and the LSOA level proportion of Welsh speakers. The basic model also included sampling weights from the survey and ran a random intercept to account for nesting within the different LSOAs. The full models adjusted for all individual and area level covariants that are outlined here. Um, so in terms of our results, um, at the individual level, um, proficient Welsh speakers were defined um, as individuals who specified that they were proficient in Welsh or could speak a fair amount of Welsh, and everyone else was coded as a non-Welsh speaker. There were um, 4,361 proficient Welsh speakers in the sample, and the rest were non-Welsh speakers. So just on the left on the regression plot here, you can see um, proficient Welsh speakers are the blue line, and non-Welsh speakers are the red line. So as you can see, the more Welsh speaking areas were associated with better mental health for both groups which is unexpected because we didn't expect to see this in the non-Welsh speakers in more Welsh speaking areas. So the more linguistically isolated people. 
The forest plot on the right is a visualization of the fully adjusted mix effects model. So the purple indicate variables with a protective relationship with mental health, uh, and the green indicates um, detrimental associations. So as you can see, um, the fully adjusted model indicated a significant main effect, um, effect of area level Welsh speaking, such that the more Welsh speaking areas were associated with better mental health. However, inconsistent with our hypothesis, we found no evidence of an interaction between individual level Welsh speaking status and the area level proportion of Welsh speaking uh, speakers after adjustment for covariates, so that's just um, circled at the bottom here. Um, As for national identity, 17, uh, nearly 18,000 people indicated that they had Welsh national identity and about 10 and a half thousand said they had no Welsh national identity. So on the, again, on the plot on the left, um, people with a Welsh national identity are the blue line and no Welsh national identity is the red line. So more Welsh identifying areas were associated with poor mental health. However, after adjusting for the covariates in the full model, there was no main effect of area level national identity and no evidence of an interaction between individual and area level national identity. So again, uh, inconsistent with our hypothesis, we found no indication of a group density association for national identity. Um, for these preliminary analyses, we conducted quite a crude group density analysis for ethnic groups in Wales. So we examined the association between ethnic group and area level proportion of non-white British ethnic minorities. So just to say you've got two minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, so the ethnic minority samples were small. Um, so there was um, the biggest group was white other with 588 people. Um, then there was 277 Asian individuals, 150 with a mixed ethnic background, 90 from an other ethnic background group, and 77 black individuals. Uh, so as you can see, um, mental health sharply decreases as ethnic density increases in the white British group. Uh, in the ethnic minority groups, there seems to be a protective association in black individuals, but the relationships uh, seem to vary more for the other groups. Um, again, on the right, we can see the fully adjusted model. So um, more highly ethnic density areas were associated with poor mental health. But then when we look at the associations between individual level ethnic minority status and area level ethnic density, um, it's protective for all, ethnic, uh, for all ethnic groups and significantly so for white of the black and Asian groups, which is consistent with our hypothesis. So we found no evidence of a group density association for language and national identity, but we did find evidence of an association for ethnic groups. Uh, so just in terms of some strengths and limitations, um, overall, we had a large sample size. Uh, secondly, examining these associations in language is novel, as far as I'm aware, no other studies have looked at this. Uh, in terms of limitations, some of our uh, variables potentially have poor reliability and validity, for example, our mental health variable. Uh, also, there's small ethnic minority sample sizes and the ethnic density analysis was quite crude, but these are preliminary analyses and we'll conduct more granular analysis in future. Um, and just uh, uh, broadly with ethnic density literature, there are problems with kind of cross-sectional uh, studies in inferring causation and limitations in terms of adjusting for, appropriately adjusting for socioeconomic status. Uh, so just to conclude, um, in these preliminary findings, we found an effect for ethnic minorities, but not for language or national identity in Wales. I think these are quite interesting null findings because we did expect that associations would extend to these groups. Um, so um, like I said, this study's in its early stages, so I'm keen to get anyone's thought or, thoughts or feedback on this. Um, these analyses were exploratory, so in future we'll be conducting analyses on more recent ways than the National Survey for Wales. And these data include a more of a, um, a clinical mental health variable that we can use. Uh, and finally, with survey data, of course, you're limited by the questions asked in the survey. So another of my PhD studies involves a qualitative interview, uh, qualitatively interviewing individuals with psychosis in low um, own linguistic density areas. And I also hope to conduct these analyses using a more psychosis related outcome because we might see that these kinds of associations are more likely to be observed for 
psychosis because there is a degree of specificity to psychosis compared to more common mental health problems. Okay, um, and that's everything. Thank you very much for listening. And does anybody have any questions? Okay, everyone, we're going to go to the final presentation uh, from today, uh, from today's panel. So this is a recorded presentation and it is uh, by Ji Yong Seo from University College London. Um, Ji Yong moved to the UK in 2017 and she's going to graduate um, from her undergraduate degree in BSc Population Health at UCL this summer. So congratulations to Ji Yong. She's interested in equality, inclusion and diversity and social, social, social epidemiology and is keen to study further emerging health issues caused by poverty and inequality in public health and international development. And she is going to start studying for an MSc um, from this autumn. Hello, I'm Jiyong So, and today I'm going to introduce my dissertation project, which examines whether there is an association between change in neighbourhood ethnic density and individual mental health in the UK. This presentation is constructed with four main sections. First, I will explain the ethnic density CCs, which is a fundamental CCs that we should look at before listening to my project. I will explain the UK Household Longitudinal Study, UK HLS, and study methods that are selected for this project. Then we will look at the findings and interpretation of the outcomes. Then finally, I will discuss some strengths and limitations of the studies and the points that, we, um, that future studies need to focus on. So I will start with what is ethnic density and its related CCs. Ethnic density is defined differently depending on the research, but we use the general term which is showing the proportion of ethnic minority groups in a neighbourhood. Ethnic minority groups in the UK are more likely to be exposed to greater risk of health, including both physical and mental health. But this ethnic density sees you suggested interesting outcomes that greater density in a neighbourhood can provide protective or positive impact on health outcomes. This is quite a new concept, but some of the UK-based studies have tested and supported the positive impacts of greater density on mental health, particularly in those from Indian and Pakistani backgrounds. So this study tests whether the positive impacts are also applied when we look at the change in ethnic density between two different time points as a predictor variable. And based on the existing research, the mechanism was developed as Increased ethnic density in a neighborhood might provide ethnic minority to have stronger social cohesion and support or the sense of community by sharing their cultural, religious and linguistic values. And this kind of environment might also reduce or prevent the racial discrimination or low status stigma in this neighborhood against ethnic minority compared to neighborhood with low proportion of ethnic minority. Then through this buffering effect, individuals will have positive or protective impacts on mental health and their well-being. The study was designed to test four main hypotheses. The first hypothesis was increasing ethnic density in the neighborhood is associated with better mental health. The second hypothesis is the positive impacts of increased density are greater for non-white groups than white ethnic groups. This will be because ethnic minority has stronger social cohesion with the same ethnic groups or other ethnic groups as found by previous studies. And this is tested in the third hypothesis, which is the greater impacts of increased density for non-white groups are moderated by better social cohesion. The last hypothesis was the positive impact of increased density is greater for living in less deprived neighborhood. And this tested whether the magnitude of positive impact are different depending on neighborhood deprivation levels, which is another environmental condition that might affect mental health. This study mainly used the UK Household Longitudinal Study, UKHLS, which is an annual household survey started in 2009 to 10 using over 40,000 UK households. 
This provides high quality multidisciplinary data on health, socioeconomic status, and social life. In the UK, HLS uh, households are selected through two stage cluster random sampling, and all household members become a part of the samples. The study data was taken from Leagues 9, which was collected in 2017 to 19 from more than 24,000 households. And a special license was applied to access the UK HLS data and access to data was under restrictive conditions. This data was combined with uh, 2001 and 2011 census data, which were used to calculate the ethnic density and neighborhood deprivation. And these were combined using the lower level super output area codes. The outcome variable in the study was mental health, and this was measured by General Health Questionnaire 12, GHQ 12. This is the validated screening tool for minor psychiatric mobility and a good proxy measure for depressive disorder in general population in non-clinical setting. I used the total score of GHQ 12, where higher value represents worse mental health. The predictor variable was the change in ethnic density between 2001 and 2011. And as mentioned before, this was measured using the census data at LSOA level. Covariates are the variables that are also able to affect mental health. So I included um, neighborhood deprivation, and this was measured by the Townsend Deprivation Index, which was widely used in health research and calculated by aggregating standardized values of four deprivation indicators. I also added social cohesion, which was measured by Buckner's Neighborhood Cohesion Instrument. And this comprises of attraction to the neighborhood, neighboring and psychological sense of community. Then I included age, sex, ethnicity, monthly gross income, highest qualification, and living areas. Multi-level modeling was used because individuals in the UK HLS are nested within household and neighborhood, but household level was excluded in this analysis because around a half of households represent only one individual and there was statistical evidence of no significant difference on mental health between individual and household levels. I will now proceed to present the findings from this project. Between 2001 and 2011, we can find evidence of England and Wales have become more ethnically diverse and dense. 92% of neighborhoods experience an increase in the proportion of ethnic minority, and the average increase across all neighborhoods was 6.4%. The previous findings showed that ethnic minority groups concentrated in more deprived neighborhoods, but as you can see in this box plot, the greatest increase was also reported in the most deprived neighborhood, which is colored in purple in this plot. This might mean that ethnic minority density was already high in the most deprived neighborhood and in, it increased the most over the 10 years. This table compared the outcomes of five multi-level regression models. I'm pleased to post a recording here if you'd like to take a look at the results and I will go over them on the next slide. Through the project, we can find that increased ethnic density was initially associated with better mental health in non-white groups as we hypothesized, but we found worse mental health in white ethnic groups. But when we when the model considered neighborhood deprivation variable, the positive impacts for non-white groups were no longer statistically significant. This might be because non-white groups concentrated in more deprived neighborhood. So controlling neighborhood deprivation variable might result in weak statistical power to detect an effect across different neighborhood deprivation levels. Or another explanation might be that people in deprivation, a deprived neighborhood have exposed to greater density before the research as we are looking at the change in ethnic density on mental health rather than just higher density at one point. 
when we added the interaction between change in density and social cohesion, the increase in ethnic density was associated with better mental health for white ethnic groups, but not for non-white groups. Through a marginal effects analysis, we can find that white ethnic groups have positive impact when they keep low or moderate social cohesion with neighbors, but there are adverse impacts when social cohesion is higher than a certain point. These findings might reflect the difficulty of disentangling the density effects and neighborhood deprivation effects, as another study showed. But it might also reflect the fact that the increase in ethnic density of non-white groups might not be homogeneous, but maybe in fact be a variety of ethnic minority groups entering the area who could have weak social interaction between themselves. Moving on from the results, I'll briefly touch on the strengths and limitations of the project. One of the main strengths of this project was that it was based on the two nationally representative sources, UK, HLS and Census. These have large sample size across different age, socioeconomic status and ethnic minority groups, and this is expected to produce valid and reliable results. The project also used a change in ethnic density over time to show stronger association of ethnic density effects and mental health. And to my knowledge, there has been no project which considered relevant neighborhood characteristics, including residential mobility or ethnic density change over time. This helps overcome the temporality of neighborhood effects on health by measuring exposures over a longer duration. Lastly, this project used less distinctive categories of ethnic groups when calculating density change because we used the proportion of ethnic minority rather than focusing on specific ethnic group. And I believe this increased validity of the results to a broader set of ethnic minorities than focusing on a specific group and also reflects the changing view of general population regarding the ethnicity. There were some limitations in this study. Firstly, we didn't consider the initial level of ethnic density levels, but focus on the change in ethnic density. Secondly, we, it was also difficult to detect the direction of causality because the data was still coming from cross-sectional study. Lastly, although this is a minor problem, as UK HLS has a large sample size, but some data was excluded when the data was processed, especially because I used the complete cases. In conclusion, the increased acid density and neighborhood deprivation were not important in determining mental health using existing UK HLS data. In this study, social cohesion was known as a potential mediator that partially linked increased density and mental health for white ethnic groups. But this still did not directly explain the density change effect because high level of social cohesion was found to have poor mental health. This study was also unable to find the association and any meaningful mediator or moderator for non-white groups. So a future study need to verify the findings in the study using other data, uh, other study data or methods. And we might need to test other confounding factors, including exposure to diverse culture and reduce low status stigma. But I believe that this kind of studies that evaluating the neighborhood and environmental impact on health is useful, especially in implementing more cost effective and efficient health interventions, because it examines the neighborhood effect, which is often overlooked in favor of individual risk. Thank you very much for your time and please let me know if you have any questions.